My name is Sarah Jane Blakemore. I am Professor of Psychology and Cognitive Neuroscience at the University of Cambridge and I run a lab that works on the adolescent brain and today I'm going to talk about the teenage brain and exams and look at whether there's a misalignment between what we know about the teenage brain and our assessment system. So adolescence is these days usually defined as the period of life between 10 and 24 years. This is a very protracted period of development. It's a unique period of profound biological, psychological and social development. Now we've only really known about how the brain develops during adolescence in the past 20 years. Before that we really knew nothing about human brain development at all and that's important because GCSEs were introduced before anything was known about how the teenage brain develops. They were introduced in the late 80s back then and right up until the early 2000s it was assumed by neuroscientists that the human brain stops developing at some point in childhood. Now we now know that that is not the case at all and that in fact the human brain continues to develop right throughout childhood and adolescence and even into early adulthood and we know that because we are now able to scan the living human brain using MRI scanning in particular. So this is an MRI scanner. MRI scans uh, produce very detailed images of the human brain and tell us a lot about how uh, um, the brain structure develops uh, across the lifespan. So brain structure, we can measure various things, including the amount of white matter and gray matter the brain contains. Now, many studies have used MRI over the past 20 years to study how the brain changes across childhood and adolescence in humans. And what those studies have shown is that there are really protracted and substantial changes to both gray matter and white matter in the human brain. And I'm gonna give you one example of that. This is a study that I was involved with led by uh, Kate Mills, um, where we analyzed data from four different cohorts of participants uh, in, in different places in the world. So um, one cohort was from NIMH in the USA, another from Pittsburgh in the USA, another from Oslo in Norway, and another from Leiden in the Netherlands. Now, all together across these four different cohorts, there were 391 participants aged between seven and 30 years. And the important thing about these studies is that they're longitudinal, in whereby each participant is scanned multiple times as they grow up, giving really high quality uh, and, and quite large scale data sets. So a couple of the main findings from this analysis um, is first of all, that cerebral white matter volume increases across adolescence. So what you're seeing here is a graph showing uh, white matter across the whole brain plotted against age in years from five to 30 years. And what you can see is that in all four cohorts, there's remarkable consistency between the four cohorts, even though they're completely independent samples of children and adolescents, there's a steady increase in white matter across late childhood through adolescence to, to mid, uh, the mid twenties. In fact, white matter volume increases by about 1% each year during adolescence. At the same time that white matter is increasing, cortical gray matter volume is decreasing. And you can see that here. So these are the same four cohorts of participants, but here you're seeing their cortical gray matter volume. So that's gray matter from the cortex, the surface of the brain uh, plotted against age and years. Here you can see that uh, cortical gray matter is highest in late childhood and then undergoes a very substantial decline during adolescence and levels off in the mid 20s. In fact, gray matter volume decreases by about 1.5% each year during adolescence. I'm going to show you that in a slightly different way. Here's a video of uh, an MRI image of the cortex of the brain. That's the surface of the brain. This is the back, this is the front. And what you see here is how gray matter changes between the ages of four and 21 in this case. Um, and gray, the, the changes in gray matter volume have been color coded. So as the brain loses gray matter, it becomes less red and more blue. So you can see that here, this is going through childhood, right throughout adolescence and up until the age of 21. And you can see those very gradual changes in gray matter volume. Um, you can also see that it doesn't happen uniformly across the whole brain. The back of the brain tends to develop 
before the front of the brain. And that's interesting because the back of the brain contains your visual cortex, that is the region that processes vision, whereas the front of the brain contains uh, areas that process uh, high level cognitive uh, processes like the prefrontal cortex here. So regions of the brain that, um, that control high level cognitive functions um, are the latest brain regions to develop. And perhaps not surprisingly, there is very substantial and protracted development uh, into cognition in adolescence, particularly to high level cognitive processes such as self-regulation, decision-making, planning, futuristic thinking, self-awareness, creativity. Creativity is, has been found to be higher in adolescence than in adulthood, exploration of the environment, uh, risk-taking. Adolescents uh, take more risks than adults do in general. And particularly, and this is what my lab focuses on, social cognition, um, social interaction, social understanding, peer affiliation and peer influence. Now to go back to the brain, what does it mean that white matter is increasing and gray matter is decreasing during adolescence? Well, these are thought to reflect really important neurodevelopmental process processes. Uh, by which we think that neuroplasticity is heightened in adolescence. And that's because these neurodevelopmental processes confer plasticity to the brain. So these neurodevelopmental processes include myelination and axonal growth. So uh, the brain contains neurons which have a long fiber attached to them called an axon. And during development, that axon grows in diameter and becomes coated in a fatty substance called myelin. And both of those processes um, uh, myelination and axonal growth mean that uh, the speed of neuronal transmission increases during development. Um, thirdly, synaptic pruning is known to occur during adolescence. That is where um, the connections between brain cells, the synapses, are pruned away if they're not being used. Now, all three of these mechanisms uh, are mechanisms of neuroplasticity. That is the way in which the brain adapts according to its environment, the way we learn new information and new knowledge. And as such, adolescence is thought of as a sensitive period of brain development with heightened neuroplasticity. This confers both opportunity to learn, to be creative, maybe opportunities for things like rehabilitation and interventions, and also vulnerability, particularly vulnerability to mental illness. And that's what I'm going to turn to next. So we know from big epidemiological studies that adolescence is a period of vulnerability to mental health problems. Most mental illnesses first appear before the age of 18 years and mental health problems such as depression and anxiety and eating disorders and self-harm have become increasingly prevalent amongst young people in the UK and the pandemic seems to have aggravated this trend. Now, the peak age of onset of mental health conditions such as depression and eating disorders occurs in mid-adolescence and so coincides with GCSEs, these multiple high stakes national exams that our young people have to sit. I think we should think about that a bit and whether that's really ideal uh, given what we know about the vulnerability that neuroplasticity in the brain confers at this age. In fact, if you ask young people, as multiple large surveys have done, what do you find most stressful? They tend to cite exam stress and fear of academic failure as their most prominent worry. In fact, calls to Childline about exam stress, workload or fear of failure doubled between 2015 and 2019. So this is a problem that's getting worse, not better. Now, not all young people are mentally uh, unhealthy. Fortunately, most are in fact fine and uh, are, and their well-being is good. But the key thing here is the individual differences are really huge. And you can even see that in the brain development data. So I'm going to show you again in my last data slide. Um, this is the cortical gray matter volume graph I showed you previously in the four different cohorts. What I showed you previously were the lines of best fit and what I didn't show you were the raw data. And that's what you can see here. Each of these dots is a different individual. And you can see that the individual differences are really vast. And the reason I'm showing you this, uh, this plot now is just to point out that GCSEs are done here when young people are between 15 and 16, when there's a vast 
amount of variation in brain development. So I suppose this is making the point that we're trying to squeeze this individual variation into a kind of one size fits all system. So just to summarize what I've said in this very short talk, the brain undergoes substantial development during adolescence, cognitive and social capacities also development, develop. We know that creativity and exploration are heightened in adolescence compared with adulthood. Adolescence is considered a sensitive period of brain development and there are vast individual differences, but we have a one size fits all assessment system. So I think we really need to think about whether GCSEs are the optimal way to assess achievements and capabilities of the developing young person. Thank you for listening.